Okay, so uh, in Acts 19, the Bible says, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were you baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then Paul said, Verily, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Okay, now, you say, well, James, what does this have to do with a thief on the cross? Well, first of all, think what Paul is saying about the purpose of John's baptism. Because if you understand John's baptism, then you're going to get some insight on the thief on the cross. Remember what, what uh, Paul said. Paul said that John's baptism was for the people to believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So John was preaching to get the people ready for Christ who was coming after him. So the Lord was to come. The Lord was on his way. He wasn't there yet, but he was on his way. And, and John was getting people ready. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, listen to what Matthew says. In those days came John the Baptist, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he's getting people ready for Christ, and he's getting people ready for the kingdom. Now listen again what John, what Paul said. Acts 19 verse 4. Paul said, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. All right? So, it is always, John's baptism was always a, a preparatory thing. His preaching was done uh, in preparation for or looking forward to something that was coming. And so John's baptism was a way to prepare people for the coming of Christ. Uh, let's look at another verse. Let's look at another verse. Let's get, let, let's get the Bible out and start letting it com comment on itself. In Luke chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. Now this is talking about John. This is a prophecy about John. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the people, uh, excuse me, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So John's baptism, John's preaching, was all about preparing people, preparing people for the Lord who was to come, preparing them for the kingdom that was to come. It was always in preparation. It was looking forward, looking forward. The kingdom's at hand. It was a baptism of repentance, for the remission of sins, getting people ready for the Lord, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So when you understand that, then you're going to start understanding the the, the time frame in which the thief on the cross lived. You're going to understand the setting, if you will, about maybe why he would ask such things. Why would he say such things? Why would he ask about uh, the kingdom and so forth? Let's look at one more. Mark chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, confessing their sins. Now, notice there are some subtle differences in John's baptism and what, and what John was preaching, like the confessing of sins. John was preaching to Jews. So he was getting people ready, turning them back to God. They were already in relationship with God. So he was trying to get them to turn back to God, prepare them uh, to get them to turn back to God. And so they had to confess their sins. Well, individuals today are not in a covenant relationship with God. And so as alien sinners, they're not required to confess their sins. They just need to obey the gospel to have their sins forgiven. Now later on, confessing your sins is something that is a, um, 
is, is a privilege, really, for the child of God. That's when they can confess their sins. We'll get to that momentarily. But I'm trying to lay out the groundwork to show you that John's baptism was a, was a preparatory baptism. His message was, was in preparation, preparing the people for the coming Messiah. His message was to lay the groundwork to get people ready for the coming Messiah. Now, when you understand that, when you understand that, then you will have a better understanding of the thief on the cross. Now, you may, say, you may be saying, well, James, I don't get where you, how you're putting these two guys together. I mean, John the Baptist was dead long by the time uh, the thief on the cross came in the, on the scene. I mean, John the Baptist had already been beheaded and his head lopped off and carried off in a charger to uh, uh, um, uh, Herodias and you know, so forth. And so how was, how was the uh, thief on the cross even remotely connected to John the Baptist? Well, let's look. Let's take consideration again. John lived and preached under the Old Testament. But he was preparing people for a new covenant. He was preparing people who were already in a covenant relationship with God to get ready for a new system that was going to come in place. Remember, he was, turning, he was talking to the children of Israel. Uh, when Jesus commanded his 70 to go out, what we call the limited commission, he told them to go to the house of Israel. All right? Why? Because we're still preparing. We want to put first things first. We want all the Jews to have, uh, have a chance to repent and, and come back to God, conform to what God says so that everything will be in place. Let's, let's don't get the cart before the horse here. So it was to the, the children of God, or the children of Israel, they were told, repent for the kingdoms at hand. Well, you don't repent and confess your sins, right? Uh, unless you're conforming back to something, all right? You, you've fallen away, you might say, you're backslidden. And that's where the Jews were. They had uh, uh, added to the, the commandments of God, the traditions of men. That's why Jesus said in, in Matthew 15, you know, you uh, have made the commandments of God of none effect by your traditions. You know, in vain they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. Who was he talking about? He was talking about the Jews. And so the message that John was preaching, that Christ was preaching, was the kingdom's at hand, repent, uh, Christ is on his way, believe on the Christ who was coming. See, this is all before Christ died on the cross. This is all before a certain point in time. So that's where John lived, that's when John was preaching, that's when Christ was preaching, but it was always preparing people for a new system. Now, let me just say this, sometimes people... Uh, you know, they want to say, well, Jesus lived under the Old Testament, so, you know, you need to get rid of everything in, 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 uh, before the book of Acts. No, don't get rid of everything before the book of Acts. Don't get rid of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Those are books that are preparing people for the kingdom and what was going to be, uh, what was going to take place in the kingdom. If you get rid of those books, you don't know what the kingdom is supposed to be like. You don't know how uh, the kingdom is going to be set up. There's a lot of information about the kingdom that's being discussed in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and if you throw that away, then you don't understand the kingdom. So, but John uh, preached con, uh, uh, the, the children of Israel, the coming of the Christ, and believe on him who should come after them, and he baptized them with the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, you're saying, all right, all right, I'm seeing pre preparation here. Preparation for the, for the coming Christ. Now, how does this get to the thief on the cross? Well, let's, let me give you one more, one more thing to think about before we get to the thief on the cross and tie this all together. All right? One more thing to think about before we get to the thief on the cross. But let's take a break here and let's give you our phone numbers one more time. Uh, we're at area code 336-427-9696. 427-9696. That is 427-WMYN or 627-9563, 627-9563-WLOE, 9563-WLOE. Now, if you'd like to be a part of the program, just call in. We'll put you right on the air. And you might have a question about the thief on the cross. Hopefully, you're, you're paying attention. Maybe you're, you're thinking. Maybe you have, you're hearing some things that you hadn't thought about before. So I want to put all this together. All right. Now, before we get to the thief on the cross, I want to talk to you about one more man. 
All right? And his name is Apollos. Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 18, verses 24 through 28. Acts chapter 18, verse 24 through 28. Now, we're going to meet this man named Apollos. And he is going to give us some insight on the thief on the cross. You say, James, you keep talking about John the Baptist, you're talking about Jesus, you're talking about his apostles, you're talking about everybody but the thief on the cross. That's right. That's right. And here's why. Listen to what Apollos was doing. Apollos was a Jew. All right? He was born in Alexandria, the Bible says, Acts 18, verse 24. An eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. Now, what does that tell you? That tells you he knows something about what God wants men to do. And being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. Now, this is one thing I know. Now, this is several, a couple things I know. Number one, I know that if he's teaching only the baptism of John, number one, that is part of the way of the Lord, and that is also something of the Lord, things of the Lord, that should have been taught. At least at one point, they should have been taught. And so here he was teaching them. He was teaching the baptism of John, but that's all he knew. He was a Jew. Now, it makes sense. He was a Jew, so it makes sense that he'd be teaching about the baptism of John. Okay? Now, listen what the Bible says about him. Verse 26. Acts 18, 26. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scripture that Jesus was the Christ. Now, let's stop and ask some questions about Apollos as we're trying to figure out this thief on the cross business. The thief on the, uh, Apollos. He began to speak in Aquila and Priscilla. Now, here's two Christians that the Bible says were in Rome, and we later we're going to find them in Corinth. But here we find, here we find Aquila and Priscilla that take Apollos aside and they expound unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now this is what I know about John's baptism then. What John was preaching about repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the things that John was preaching about confessing sins, the things that John was preaching about um, the Christ is coming, that's part of the way of God, but it's not the perfect way. It's not the complete way. John's baptism, John's message, John's ministry was an incomplete ministry. And therefore, when, when someone was, was being taught it, they were being taught, okay, this is like the prerequisite. This is the things you do before you actually get to the, the main thing. Now, my daughter's in college, and so she's having to take a lot of prerequisite things. And I think she came home the other day, and she was happy because the grade she had made in high school made her be exempt from... I don't remember what it was, chemistry or algebra or something. I don't, I don't remember what it was. But nonetheless, the things that she'd taken before had prepared her, the, the school said, prepared her sufficiently for the next course. Well, John's baptism, John's ministry, was the first course. And now when Christ has come, then that's the next course. And so individuals who had obeyed John's baptism, they were prepared. They were being prepared for what was coming. Well, this is where we find Apollos. Apollos had only taken the first course. All he knew was John's baptism. That's all he knew was get people ready for the coming of Christ. He knew the way of the Lord, but he didn't know it perfectly. Now, let me ask you this. What was different? What was it, what was it that Apollos was teaching that needed to be tweaked? What was it that Paul was teaching that needed to be added to? What was it that Paul was teaching that he was leaving out or that he didn't know perfectly? See, what was, the, what was it that he was uh, 
uh, leaving out was it? Well, he didn't know how he didn't know how to say Jesus' name. Now that's what Marty Roberts down here at Souls Harbor is going to say, but that's wrong. That's wrong. Well, was it? Well, you need to be baptized as an outward sign of an inward faith. No, that's that's not what he was doing differently. Well, if we find out what Apollos was doing differently, we find out what he started doing, then that's going to tell us that's going to tell us something about the difference between John's baptism and the New Testament baptism. And that will then help us understand the thief on the cross and why you and I don't have to be baptized. All right, stay with me. Here we go. What was he doing differently? What what did what did Apollos Start doing differently. That's what you have to ask. You, that's what you have to ask yourself. See, friends, when you're studying the Bible, sometimes you need to stop, and you just need to ask yourself some questions. And this is one of those. When you're reading Acts 18 and you read about Apollos, and you're reading, well, he was a mighty man, eloquent in the Scriptures, and he he knew only the baptism of John. Well, stop and say, all right, now what was he taught differently? Well, look what the next verse says. When he was disposed to pass into Achaia, still in Acts 18 here, when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, that's where Corinth is, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much which had believed through grace. Now, how did he help them? See, that's where you stop and ask, well, how did he help them? How, how was he helping? Whatever that Aquila and Priscilla had done to teach him the way of God more perfectly was actually going to help some folks. So what uh, what have they done to help? Well, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Now you see the difference? John's baptism was a baptism to get people ready for Christ. And that's all, that's all Apollos knew. But the difference when he was taught the way of God more perfectly, what he began doing was convincing people, showing people by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. In other words, he started convincing people that Jesus has already come. He started convincing people that, hey, John's baptism is no longer valid. Now you need to get ready because Christ has already come. You, you missed the, the preparation window. Now, you need to do something a little differently. All right? John's baptism was a preparatory baptism. It was to get you ready for it. But notice, the Lord had come. Now, when John first started preaching, remember, the Lord was coming. He was to come. The kingdom was to come. The kingdom was at hand. But now, now Christ has already come. See, now, when you're reading your Bible, notice the difference between Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when you're talking about the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. The kingdom's coming, the kingdom's coming, it's on its way, it's on its way, it's on its way. And then when you get to Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, you have Peter and the other 11 standing up, and here's what their sermon involves. Their sermon is, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye crucified both Lord and Christ. That's Acts 2 verse 36. See the difference? John was preaching, get ready, believe on him who should come after me, or after him, after John. Believe on those who, on, on the one that will become that will come after John. But now, on the day of Pentecost, the message is a little different. The message now is, you killed Christ. He came. <laughs> the one that, that God sent, he came and you killed him. So what's the difference? The difference is, the Lord had come. He had died. He was buried. And he was raised again on the third day. He had ascended into heaven. He was exalted. Now he's sitting on the right hand of God and he's reigning in his kingdom. Now that's a big difference from what John was preaching back way over, over there in, in Mark chapter 1. <clears throat> when, when John first started preaching, he's saying, believe on him who should come after me. Believe on him. He's coming. He's coming. The kingdom's at hand. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Get ready. And then next two, boom. Hey, the kingdom's already here. Christ has come and he's gone. 
Christ has come and went. He's, he's come here. You killed him. You crucified him. He's actually been buried. He rose again on the third day, and he's going back to heaven. So if you didn't believe on him before then, now you've got some changes to do. See that? Now listen again to what, John, what Paul says in, Mark, in Acts 19. In Acts 2, Peter said, <clears throat> This same Jesus whom ye have crucified, God hath made both Lord and Christ. And then Paul says in Acts 19, remember now he's looking back, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. So, why would you preach, believe on someone who's coming if he's already come? Believe on someone who's coming if, well, he's already gone. See? Paul was telling people, you should believe on Jesus because he's already come. You should believe on Jesus because you missed it. You missed the boat. You missed the fact that Jesus was coming and you didn't get ready, you didn't listen to John's baptism, you weren't prepared, or you didn't heed the warning when John came, and so now you've got some other preparation to make. Now you need to be baptized for the remission of sins. So what Paul was saying in Acts chapter 19 was you need to look back. You need to look back because Christ has already come. Now look at Acts 19 and verse 5. Do you have your Bibles? Acts 19 to verse 5. Paul says, Believe on him which should come after Christ Jesus. That's, he said that's what John was preaching. John was preaching repent, baptism of repentance, saying to the people, Believe on him who's coming. Believe on him who's coming. And now notice, notice verse 5. Acts 19 to verse 5. When they heard this, when they heard what? When they heard this, what had they heard? They heard that John's baptism was no longer valid. That's what they heard. They heard John's baptism was no longer valid. Therefore, what they had believed was no longer valid. The baptism that they had obeyed, John's baptism, it didn't do them any good. Why? Because John's baptism was a baptism to get people ready for Christ, and Christ has already come. And, and when they heard this, when they heard the explanation about the purpose of John's baptism, that's when the Bible says they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's not because they'd heard, well, you've got to say a certain thing when you're baptized. No. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. What had they heard? They didn't hear, well, it's an outward sign of an inward grace. No, they didn't hear that either. What they heard was, your baptism is no longer good. What you have obeyed, what you have obeyed is, is no longer valid. What you were baptized for is, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not important now. I mean, you're preparing for something that's already happened. Right? You're preparing for something that's already happened. Listen, you don't, you know, it's, it's like someone says, well, I'm going to, uh, let's see, it's November, I'm going to carve my jack-o'-lantern. Well, too late now, right? You, you already passed the day, right? Someone says, well, I'm, I'm going to uh, I'm, I'm going to get ready for the 4th of July and get some fireworks. Well, man, it's November. You, you, you missed the boat, you know? If you want to celebrate Independence Day, you should have bought your fireworks back in July. Too late. And so that's what Paul is saying about that's what Paul is saying about John's baptism. Notice in 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4. This is a verse everybody knows about about uh, um, the gospel, right? Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. But what was Paul telling to him? He said, uh, "For I delivered." Unto you, first of all, that which also I received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the Scriptures. So the gospel that Paul was preaching was, Jesus has come, he died, he was buried, he rose again. 
So if you're baptized with John's baptism, which said, get ready because Christ is coming, that's, that's, uh, you know, that's a little, you're a little too late for that. You're a little too late for that. Now, you have to understand the reason. Why would baptism need to be changed? Why would John's baptism not be valid? I mean, I hear people all the time say, well, I've been baptized, I've been baptized. Well, you, you may have been baptized, but that doesn't mean it's valid. Wasn't for the right reason. Didn't do you any good. And that's why when people talk about baptism and they say, well, it's not important. Well, in Acts 19, it must have been so important because the people who had been baptized wrong, they actually were baptized again to make sure they were baptized right. See, when they, were, when they understood mm, you were baptized for the wrong reason, they were baptized for the right reason. Now notice this. When Christ died, friends, a new covenant was put in place. A new covenant was put in place. Hebrews 8, verse 13. In that he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old, now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Now what is that saying about the Old Testament? The old law. The law under which John lived but was preparing people for the end of. It's ready to decay and vanish away, wax away, vanish away. It's waxing old. It's expired. Basically what it is, it's expired. You ever, you ever get a coupon, you know, and uh, you, you look at these coupons and, man, this looks good. I think I'm going to go pick me up a, a sandwich or something. I find some coupons at the house of the day and, I said, you know, we ought to go get us a Subway. Here's some coupons for Subway. You know, $3, six inch foot long, uh, six inch foot long. A six inch foot long? No, you can't get a six inch foot long. But, you know, three, $3.50 for a six inch sandwich or something. Start looking at it. Oh, it expired last week. Expired November 1st or whatever. Well, that's no good. Just throw it away. Because if you go try to... To redeem that coupon, they're going to say, well, I'm sorry, it expired. It's, it's decayed. It's ready, to, it's ready to vanish away. And that's what John's baptism was. Hebrews 10, verse 9, and lo, and he said, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. Hebrews 9, 15 through 17. For this cause, he's the mediator of a new testament, that by the means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also be of necessity uh, be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead. Otherwise it is no strength at all while the testator liveth. So, why was Apollos, what he was teaching, why was it no longer valid? Why did he need to learn something a little better? Because the Old Testament, that he was telling everybody, hey, get ready for the New Testament. It's coming. The New, what, new, the new Covenant's already here. Apollos, you know? <laughs> Can you imagine a car dealer? You know, here we are. We're at the end of, we're coming up on the end of the of the 2017 year, and the car dealer's going, hey, get ready. The 2015s are about to roll off the line. You're going, well, man, you're crazy. We're, we're fixing to get into 2018. And you're trying to sell me a brand new 2015? See, I mean, who who would do that? You would think if a if a, if a car dealer said, "Hey, yeah, we're we're clearing out these we're clearing out these 2017s, getting ready for the 2015s," you're going backwards. So you think that's crazy? So you have to understand that one law has ended. One law has ended. When Christ died, one law ended and another one came into effect. Now, what about the thief? What about the thief? Finally going to get to the thief, huh? Yeah, finally going to get to the thief. You want to have a question about a thief? Let me take the time to give you a phone number. 336-427-9696. 336-427-9696. Or 627-9563. 627 627-9563. Nine five six three. Here's a question that someone sent about the thief. My question: If you must be baptized in order to get to heaven, how do you explain the thief on the cross, who Jesus said would be with him in paradise that day? 
Jesus forgave the thief, obviously, as he told him he would be going to heaven, and there is no way possible for this man to be baptized. This is the question I want to ask. Okay, good question. What about the thief? Well, think about all we've said about the time frame leading up to the New Testament being in effect. John's baptism or John's message, John was preaching, you know, repent the kingdom of the hand. Jesus was telling his disciples, tell them repent the kingdom of the hand. It was a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins, getting them ready for the kingdom to come. And so now you've got this thief on the cross. Let, let's just say, you know, one of the last persons that Jesus talked to before he died was a thief on the cross. Now, what about the thief? Well, think about the thief's request. Let's go back and look at that. In Luke 23, all right, Luke 23 and verse 42, the thief said unto Jesus, Remember, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, think about that request. Remember, I'm, I'm trying to tell you, when you're reading this, stop and ask yourself a question. How did the thief know about the kingdom? I mean, isn't that kind of a strange question to ask your, 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 your or request to make? You're, you're hanging on the cross, you're fixing to die. I mean, you've got just hours to live. And... All of a sudden, you're getting fit to get this deathbed religion, right? Boy, I'm, I'm in rough shape. And he, and he said, you know, he said to the other thief, uh, he said, we, we are hanging up here justly. We received the due of our, of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. But he asked Jesus, remember when you come to your kingdom. Why would he say that? I mean, isn't that kind of strange? Have you ever stopped thinking about that? Why would you say, remember when you come into your kingdom? I mean, why wouldn't he say, Lord, forgive me? But why would he mention the kingdom? I mean, who, who would think about the kingdom? You know why? Why would you ask about the kingdom? Let me tell you why. He obviously knew something about the kingdom. Where would he hear anything about the kingdom? Do you think perhaps he had heard John the Baptist preaching? Or maybe Jesus preaching? Listen. All the time, remember all this time that Jesus and John are, are preaching and they're uh, uh, baptizing people with a baptism of repentance for their remission of sins. What are they saying? They're saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. In Mark 1 verse 14, now after that John was put in prison, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Friends, there's two things that are connected with the message of the coming kingdom. That is, the kingdom's at hand and repent with a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Now, now, when someone says, well, he, has, he just has Jesus to remember when he comes into the kingdom. Well, I guarantee you this, if he heard something about the kingdom, he heard something about being baptized. If he had heard something about the kingdom and he knew that Jesus was supposed to set up a kingdom or he was going to have a kingdom, he heard something about being baptized for the remission of sins because the kingdom's at hand. Now, had he been baptized? I don't know. I don't know, but I know he'd heard about it. And the fact that he'd heard about it Maybe he had been baptized with the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. There's, there's just as much evidence to say that he was as to say he wasn't. But here's my point. It doesn't really matter if he had been or had not. Jesus could forgive sins any way he wanted to. But the fact that the thief is asking about the kingdom tells us that he'd heard something not only about the kingdom, but he'd also heard about baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. I mean, maybe he heard John preaching. Maybe he had heard Jesus preaching. Maybe he had heard uh, Jesus, John, and all his disciples preaching. I don't know. But do you know for sure that he was not baptized with John's baptism? 
which was the baptism of repentance for the rent of sins? I mean, how do you know what it wasn't? And remember, if this man was a Jew, I don't know what he was, but if he was a Jew, he was already in a covenant relationship with God. All he needed to do is confess his sins too. See? Repent. The baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. He can confess and, and Christ could forgive him. In Mark chapter uh, 2, we learn that Jesus had the power on earth to forgive sins. In Mark chapter 2, verses 9 through 11, this is when the uh, man sick with palsy was, was in, in front of Jesus. And Jesus said, uh, Take up thy bed and walk, or thy son, thy sin be forgiven thee. And, you know, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes that were there, you know, they thought in their heart, who can forgive sins but God? And here's what Jesus says. Mark 2, verse 9. Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? Which is easier to say? Which one? Well, both of them are pretty easy to say. But for me, neither one can be done. I can't say, and it happened. I can't say to someone, take up thy bed and walk if they've been crippled. And I can't say your sin be forgiven thee. But the one who has the power to do both of those things is God. And this is what Jesus says. Mark 2 verse 10. But that he may know, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise and take up thy bed and go thy way into thine house. So, while Jesus was alive on earth, a testament, an Old Testament, was still in effect. The testator had not died yet. New Testament had not been enforced. And therefore, individuals like this thief on the cross could say, remember me when you come to your kingdom. And obviously he'd heard about repent, be baptized with the baptism of repentance for the mental sins. He'd heard about the kingdom. So who's to say that he hadn't been? But even if he hadn't, Jesus had the power on earth to forgive sins because he hadn't died yet. Now you see, the way of God, the perfect way of God, is not being saved like the thief on the cross. It's not John's baptism. It's not the kingdom's coming, the kingdom's near. It's not get ready. It's Christ has already come. Christ has already come, and this is how you and I are living. We are living under a system where we are required to render obedience to God because Christ has already come. He's already lived. He's already died. He's already raised again the third day and ascended to heaven. And his law is in effect now. Think about this, friends. The thief lived under the Old Testament. And as long as Christ was alive, the New Testament was not in effect. And he could speak away sins. He could, he could say they're gone. He could say, this day you'll be with me in paradise. And that is the same has the same power as saying your sins are forgiven. I mean, if he if he could say to a man who is sick of the palsy, "Thy sins be forgiven thee," in order to heal him, well, surely he could say to the thief on the cross, "This day thou wilt be with me in paradise," and his sins be forgiven him. But that's all because the Old Testament was still in effect, and the New Testament had not gone into effect yet, but the New Testament law went into effect after Jesus died. And that's why in the Great Commission, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus said, go, I mean, this is the last thing Jesus said before he ascended into heaven, friends. I mean, let's, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. The last thing Jesus said before he went up into heaven was go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. 
Now, friends, I mean, really the last thing that he says is he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And we still have people going, well, what about the thief on the cross? Man, the thief on the cross happened, uh, you know, 40 days ago. 40 days before Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel, that's when he talked to the thief on the cross. Actually, 43 days, you get right into it. He said it right before he died. He was in the grave three days and he rose, and 40 days later is when he ascended to heaven. And so if he would said, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, and he that believeth and is like the thief on the cross shall be saved. But he didn't say that, friends. He didn't say that. He didn't say that. And the fact that there's so many individuals that are, uh, you know, that are just uh, careless, really, I don't know if careless or willfully careless or whatever about what a person must do to be saved is pretty sad. Because they won't tell you the whole truth. They just, they want to tell you about the thief on the cross. Or they want to tell you about the sinner's prayer, but they won't tell you what the Lord said. I have right here in my hands a, a track. Uh, and it's got on it Charity Baptist Church in Eden. And on the back it says, here's the sinner's prayer. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Come into my heart and save me. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. Amen. No scripture. No scripture. Be merciful to me, a sinner, was said by a man who was already in a covenant relationship with God. Much like the thief on the cross could have very well been in, already in a covenant relationship with God. And so the way their sins are forgiven are not the way you're not, yours and mine are going to be forgiven. We are living under a different system, a different, a different covenant. And thus, the rules are different. The rules are different. Now, <clears throat> let me tell you why this is so important to us, friends. Because a lot of people will tell you, well, I believe in baptism. But it's just not for the forgiveness of sins. Listen to this. This is from the, the website of Osborne Baptist Church there in Eden. And it says, we are excited that you are interested in baptism. We believe that baptism is an important step of obedience for every person who has accepted Christ as his or her Savior. My friends, where is that? There's no scriptures here. No scripture. They believe baptism is important. Now here's what they say about what we believe about baptism. Who should be baptized? Uh, it says, Salvation occurs when a person places his or her faith in the death and resurrection of Christ as sufficient payment for his or her sin. That's not in the Bible. It says, If you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you are ready to be baptized. That's not in the Bible. Uh, baptism is an opportunity to show others that you have accepted Christ and are walking with him. That's not in the Bible. The Bible says baptism what puts you into Christ. Galatians 3, 26, 27. Now, they go on to say, baptism symbolizes that you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. You're symbolically washed clean. Your sins are forgiven by his death on the cross. Uh, now, here's the, here's the kicker. Jesus instructed us to be baptized. Baptism is an act of obedience. While it is not necessary for salvation, it demonstrates submission to God. Friends, how can you submit to God's will but not be obedient to him? And how can you say that, well, it's an act of obedience, but it's not necessary for salvation. If it's not necessary for salvation, then obedience is not necessary for salvation. If baptism is an act of obedience, but not necessary for salvation, then you're saying you can disobey God and be in heaven. See the problem we're having here? And what are we, what are we doing? These things that I'm reading from the Osborne Baptist website, and it, and it could be on any Baptist website or, or denominational website concerning baptism. But what we're getting down to is, you remember that man that we talked about in the very beginning? That lawyer that tried to justify himself and not wanting to be 
you know, to do what God said? He willing to justify himself as who's my neighbor? Well, what we have is we have people who are trying to justify themselves about being baptized. And so they say, well, it's, it's, it's obedience, but it's not necessary. It just demonstrates that we have submitted to God. So it's necessary for obedience, but not necessary for salvation. But you're submitting to God, but you don't have to do it. If I don't have to be saved, then I don't have to submit to God's will. If God says I need to be baptized. See this? And then they have a then they have a little button here. Click a little link here. Click here to register for baptism. Now, listen to what this says. If you want if you want to register to be baptized. Once we receive your registration form, we will contact you regarding your baptism. Funny, the Bible doesn't say anything about a registration form. We have baptisms during our worship services a number of times throughout the year. If there is not an upcoming baptism scheduled, we'll get in touch with you and let you know when the next one will be, will take place. Now, friends, listen, the Bible doesn't talk about registration forms. I mean, it's, I'm chuckling, but it's, it's really sad. The Bible talks about rendering obedience to God immediately. In Acts 3, Acts 2, verse 37, they said, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter and the others have already convicted them of their sins. You've killed Christ. What shall we do? What shall we do? And they said, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins after you schedule an appointment by filling out this registration form. Peter didn't say that. Can you imagine Acts 2, verse 38, reading, Be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ after you fill out a registration form? No, it says, Father, Mr. Sins. Father, Mr. Sins. It's immediate. They, they, do things, they did things immediately. In Acts chapter 16, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, here's Paul and Silas, they're in prison. Earthquake comes, we're at midnight. The jailer comes in, he's, he thinks everybody's gone, and he's ready to kill himself. And they spring in, trembling, and... He says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Now, stop there, friends. Listen, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. They're telling the man to believe on Jesus Christ. In order to believe on Jesus Christ, you need to hear something. You need to hear something that will produce belief or faith in Christ. So what does the next verse say? The next verse says, And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized in all his house straightway. Now, can you imagine Paul and Silas telling this man, he says, what must I do to be saved? And they said, well, you need to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And obviously they're going to tell him he needs to be baptized. And he says, well, when can I be baptized? And they said, well, you need to fill out this registration form. And someday when we're passing back through here, we'll baptize you. A couple times a year, this man was prepared to die he thought that he was going to die with the morning light because the prisoners had escaped. I mean, he was ready to kill himself. He thought his, his life was over. And you're telling me, well, fill out a registration form? See, they didn't do that, friends. You know why? Because baptism is for the remission of sins. It's in baptism where you contact the blood of Christ. In, Acts, in Colossians chapter 2, I'm running out of time here, Colossians chapter 2, the Bible says, We're buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who has raised him from the dead. It's in baptism where God operates. That's where God does the work, friends. Now, friends, that's why, let's get back to the old thief on the cross. The thief on the cross lived under a time that you and I do not live under. We live under a new system, a new testament, a new covenant. And... Therefore, we have to follow the laws that are now in place. That is the New Testament. You don't find a thief on the cross, anybody being saved like the thief on the cross, after Jesus' death. You just don't find it. But you know what you find? Everywhere in the New Testament, someone obedient to the gospel, they were always baptized for their original sins. They didn't wait, didn't fill out a registration form, you know. 
They didn't schedule a time when maybe, perhaps, one day we can get together and do it. No. It was immediate. It was immediate. And so that's why the thief on the cross is not someone you should be listening to. The thief on the cross is not someone you should be pattering your salvation after. Just because Jesus told him, this day you'll be with me in paradise. Well, listen, the next time you see Jesus and he says, today you'll be with me in paradise, you know, then, then I guess you're good to go. But until then, friends, that's, that's not the case. That's not the case. Friends, I really appreciate your attention. Appreciate you listening. I'm going to wrap up here, but I'm going to give you my content information. A word from the Lord is brought to you by the Church of Christ. It meets at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. We meet at Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship, and Thursday nights at 7 p.m. And you can reach me at 276-340-2653. Until next time, friends, always make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord. Have a good night.